Dear my colleague and friend, good afternoon. I'm Akiyoshi Higuchi as the president of IEF, and uh, so I would like to begin to the ceremony of uh, Hans Hoffman's me memorials. So <coughs> Hans Hoffman was living proof of how fine a person can be. He was a great colleague. The character of the life he lived might be summed up in a few words. He was a sincere, he was honest, and he was loyal. As IAF, as IAF Vice President Hans led his staff in such a way that he exemplified leadership. He gave energy, commitment, and inspiration to people with whom he worked. He was bright, logical, and systematic in his thinking. He was always willing to share his ideas and information. He was passionately in, interested in uh, aeronautical engineering and marketing matters and would brilliantly advise us on astronautics. In his career, he worked with in integrity and energy. When I started as a president, he taught me the word <coughs> discipline that IAF officers should keep dignity and be responsibilities for their duties to the Federation. Since then, I'm trying to follow his words. By his death, all the people who knew him will miss a highly intelligent and vibrant individual with the charm of his personality. Our sorrow is lessened only slightly with the comforting thought that we had the privilege to know him. I leave also Lauk, Heinz Stower, and Maria Antonietta Perino to have a word as well. Thank you. Mr. President, <coughs> dear Jean-Jacques, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me and for Heinz and uh, Maria to speak to you tonight about our dear friend Hans Hoffmann who has left us so suddenly. We have shared, uh, we will share his life in two sections. I will talk about the launcher side of his career and Heinz will talk about the space lab and uh, Columbus and also his early work on, on the launchers. Hans Hofmann, there we have him. Hans Hofmann was one of the leading German post-war space pioneers in industry. He became a true European. He was in Paris for many years. <coughs> and he devoted large part of his professional life to international cooperation. He spent years in the United States. I will come back to that. He had many talents, as we have already heard a, a number of them. He was an excellent engineer, manager, and diplomat. His mind was open and kept looking beyond borders. He was friendly and courteous, and could organize good compromises. He never used his tall stature, that we all remember him, to demonstrate power or superiority, but rather was a real gentleman and could be very charming. On December 9th, 
2014, he left us completely unexpected and shockingly sudden in the midst of his many activities. He died in a Bremen hospital shortly after a heart attack. He had been traveling a lot in the last few months. He had been to Toronto. He had gone back to the States for a holiday, came back to Bremen, and there fate caught him. Many of his friends followed him on his last journey, and this is a memorable picture. Just before in that year, he had celebrated his 80th birthday on April 10th in good health, and you know he was limping a bit. He had his hip operated. He was quite keen to take that operation. It was successful, and he was in very good spirit among, as you can see, his family and his friends. Hans was born in 1934 in Stettin as the son of a captain at sea. However, his father urged him not to follow him in his profession, but rather become an engineer. So he decided to be an aeronautical engineer. He studied aeronautical engineering in Aachen, Germany, and already then he, he realized that it was important to have a broad education, and he went to Wichita, Kansas, and the United States to study a few years there and make his uh, master's examination. And then he came back to Germany and uh, went into the newly evolving German aircraft industry in the north in 1961. That's when his industrial career really started. In the same year, he was asked to join Erno. Erno stands for Entwicklungsring Nord, Development Center North in Bremen, one of the early space companies in Germany, which had just been formed. Actually, is one of the first, I think, three uh, young engineers to enter, taking all the risks of a new field. And remember, he had not studied uh, space, he had studied aeronautics. And he told me many times that the challenges were <laughs> real big and he was confronted pretty soon in that year to get involved in the launcher of ELDO, third stage. That was his first task. He became program manager of, of uh, the, the, the Bremen part of ELDO. And it was, of course, developed together with Bölkenig, Bölk, Bölko Company in Munich, and Heinz will come back to that. In 69, uh, he was asked to take the position of technical director in Eldo, and he moved to Paris. And many of the later famous uh, engineers involved, and I just learned from Jean-Jacques that he was one of them, cooperated at that time already. Frederick Dallès was one of them. Uh, cooperated uh, uh, with him on the new project ELDO-3 or Europa-3 because, of course, the ELDO launcher, I have a picture of the ELDO launcher, Jean-Jacques, it's, it's <laughs> and uh, well, the ELDO launcher, as, as it was conceived, was, too, uh, was not able to lift uh, the by then necessary payloads. So here came Europa 3, and uh, he got engaged into that. But besides that, he also was in charge of negotiations with NASA about the cooperation within the post-Apollo program, from which the Space Lab evolved. We'll hear more about that from Heinz. Coming back to Eldo 3, he was concerned uh, uh, to early involve space industry in the designs. And there were five different ELDO Europa 3 designs. And there was, that's by the way, a picture of him as the director in ELDO sitting next to Van Reet and Aubinier, je crois. Um, and then he started uh, on design concepts and he had early development work passed out to industry. And you see it is called Europa 3. 
It's a body motor, there's the thrust frame, which at that time was granted as an early <coughs> job to MAN, the company Jörg Feusel and I come from. And uh, if you like, uh, that's a picture from later, but it, it's, it shows the concept of Europa 3, I think B, version B, with four Vulcan engines, including the turbo pumps. And that actually is, is what Ariane was all about. So he, you, we could call him an early promoter of the later Ariane. And, uh, but you know, the fate of Eldo caught also him. In 93, ministers decided not to continue the Eldo program. And that was a difficult year because that time ESA, ESA was formed and Ezra and Eldo were uh, emerged together. And uh, well, there was not a majority for launchers anymore, but France took the flag. And uh, together under Isaac Ness came forward with, uh, I think the first one was L3S, Launcher Troisième Génération, uh, Supplement, uh, oui. Uh, and he uh, went back to Bremen. That was actually a change in his career. And as he went back to Bremen, he, by the way, of course, uh, Erno was involved in the third, in the, in the Ariane, and he took, they took the second stage integration. And uh, they also became a member of Ariane Espace. And uh, Hans was an early member of the board of Ariane Espace. And he stayed connected to that activity. Um, and this, of course, is uh, the launch, the successful launch of Ariane on 21st December 1979 with the first stage as I had just shown it to you. And uh, later in 80, Ariane Spass was formed. He, he was on the board and he stayed there quite some time. And uh, you know, Ariane, uh, the Ariane family has created an Ariane Historic Club, uh, which makes a, a meeting every year up till, up till now. And he always participated in this. And uh, so he stayed connected very much to the launcher side. When he turned back, returned back to Bremen in 73, uh, he concentrated uh, mainly on the Space Lab. And we'll hear the success story of Space Lab in a minute. He was also moved to the, uh, CT as a, to the position of CTO of Erno. And, uh, he made Space Lab a success and thus prepared the participation of Europe and Germany in the Columbus module for the ISS. In 84, he took the position of founding director of Interspace, the first European center for space exploitation. 89 then was the year in which DASA was created by merging Erno, Donny and Volko, and he became marketing director of this new company. But he didn't stay there very long because in the course of restructuring uh, the new company, he was asked to become the chairman of the CEO of Atlas Electronic, a defense company, and he left space at that time. That was 10 years before he retired, which he did in 99 at the age of 65. But that certainly was not the end of his uh, activities. He was asked, uh, he became a consultant to OHP and he was asked one day to, as OHP became a shareholder of Opcom, to reorganize that company. That's why he went to the States. That's why he did a successful job restructuring Opcom, which today is a quite prosperous company, I hope. And he stayed on the board of Opcom until 12. Each year he went there for the board meetings and uh, he was glad and happy that everything moved well. After his retirement, and in parallel to his other duties, he promoted the exchange of new ideas and ventures among the spacefaring nations within the frame of IAA, IAF, and IAC. He was chairman of Commission 3, which deals with space technologies and system development, 
of the IEA from 03 to 05, and he was coordinator of the Symposium D4, as you can see here, which deals with visions and strategies for the future of IAC from 03 until his death. In this period, I worked together with Hans at, I, at all these three organizations and from uh, nine, from 03, uh, we two uh, participated practically in all IAC meetings and congresses, traveling together with our wives and became real friends, a relationship which even increased when we both lost our dear ones. His large experience, and I come back to his picture, his large experience, openness, and diplomatic talent made him the ideal personality for the position of honorary secretary of the IAF from 09 until his death. During his career, he held many positions in different advisory bodies and received many awards. They are too much, too long to be listed here. And uh, summing up, with these outstanding achievements in the field of aerospace, I fully, we fully support the nomination of Hans Hoffmann for the IEF Hall of Fame, and we are grateful to Maria Antonietta Berino that she has started this initiative. And she will speak as one of the last speakers. Now it's Heinz' turn, please. Mr. President, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, friends of Hans, it's an honor and it's a duty to speak uh, at this uh, moment because um, Hans and my uh, first meeting goes back as long as you can think back. I joined uh, the South, what became eventually MBB, etc., etc., in 1962 as Benjamin of the Astris team. I had lots to do with, uh, with Hans because uh, Hans was the project manager from the north and I was the project engineer, very small little project engineer, but I had studied physics and I was what is now called the system engineer of the south. So Hans and I met in this period. That's why I want to show you just a couple of pictures of his period there, but then I will focus on the space lab because space lab was part of Hans's life and Hans has really lived through Space Lab and the build-up of that. This is the first photo I could fi find of Hans. You see the long Hans always standing there in the middle of, uh, of uh, his colleagues uh, looking at the uh, outer structure of, of Astris, which was a Titan uh, uh, sheet metal uh, new construction, very chancy uh, project for a third stage which didn't work too badly. And here a photo of the test stand in Trauen. Trauen and Lampolshausen were the two uh, test centers of, uh, of uh, us at that time, of Verko and Erno at that time. And Hans was in the middle of it all the time, uh, inspiring his team, leading his team. He was a great leader and a very inspiring leader. This is... Uh, a shot of the Astris as it eventually was on top of the, of the various Eldo versions one and two at least, and sometimes functioned, but because of the Eldo story, which you all know, of course, had a short-lived life. Hans at that time became a star, a small star in the real sense of the word. In Bremen, he was famous, he was the long, tall Hans, and most of the people, his colleagues called him Mr. Raumfahrt. Mr. Space. He, was, he liked that title because he lived space, even though what Horst has shown you just now, he's come from the aeronautics side and he's never left it there. Hans then went to Eldo. Horst just uh, explained that. And here's a picture when he visited the Otto Brunn facility and played with a small, with a small engine which was developed in Lampoldshausen, which became a very famous engine still used today at various telecommunication systems, uh, deep space systems, etc. Fantastic, fantastic development. So, second page, post-Apollo negotiations. 
I should uh, preface this. I was at McDonnell Douglas at that time, the project manager of the Space Tug. And I had the precarious situation of being on the NASA side doing quite a number of those post-Apollo negotiations because of my involvement with this. But before, there were three phases of negotiations. The first one was shuttle wings, ailerons, flaps. NASA decided cannot be done because of the interdependency which today is manageable, but then was not really manageable from the, from the that was the first, the first phase. The second phase was on the space tug, a vehicle which uh, should have flown in the shuttle, flying in a reusable way, low Earth orbit, to geosynchronous orbit and back. Uh, there is some plans today, again, to revive that project uh, in certain quarters. And that was a very strong, particularly a very strong elder preoccupation because the space tug was to be the vehicle as the shuttle was for low Earth orbit missions into geosynchronous and other, other missions. But for technology reasons and others, it just was not possible. NASA declined. So Manfred Fuchs, uh, in fact, close collaborator and known to most of you, uh, invented the idea of a sortie lab or RAM study, which was done together with uh, General Dynamics at that time. And uh, being a friend of Hans and uh, close associate with him in the same company in Erno, the sortie lab finally, and this is a long story in a very few words, became the option for the negotiation with NASA and as you all know the story. Hans had a massive, massive role in this. He was part of a four-man uh, uh, delegation who did these negotiations. And one of those uh, persons is in the audience here, Mr. Jean-Pierre Coase, who was leading that organization and that negotiation at that, at that time. To make, to make a jump, Hans was, came back, as uh, Horst has said, to uh, Bremen in 1973 and became the project manager of Space Lab for the MESH team. The MESH team consisted largely of uh, Erno, Matra, uh, Alitalia, uh, Senea, and a few more companies, which were competing against the Cosmos Consortium, which was led by, by Burko and had Selenia on the, on the team, and Aerospatial, uh, and a few other companies. And it was probably the toughest competition that was run in Europe for a long time because it was winner take all. It was a real serious competition. Lots of stories to be told about this one, but finally, to make the story short, this was the big day in Bremen, 7 June 1974, where the letter of intent signed by the then Director General of ESRO, uh, Professor Hocke, was turned over to Professor Egger and the entire, the entire team in Bremen. That started the fame of uh, Bremen in man space in Germany and certainly in part also in Europe. The next big step in that was a big team mission to the US because you must think back. The time was we were very small. We hadn't built a functioning launch vehicle. We hadn't hardly built any well-functioning spacecraft and, um, and the US was going to the moon. So had been on the moon at that time. So we had lots of conviction to do for the Americans to believe that we could do it, to have trust in us. And Hans was certainly, you see him here in the middle of it, uh, with Chris Kraft, myself, Klaus Berg, Franco Emiliani, and a few others in that mission, which was, if you will, almost a sales story to try to convince NASA management we can do it, even though they had enormous skepticism at that time because we had no experience. It was a project from scratch. Hans's role and his long colleague, his tall colleague, Bernd Kosegarten, were masters in the show business of leading politicians through the mock-ups and uh, demonstrating it 
like Bundespräsident Scheel or uh, the Bürgermeister of Bremen, Mr. Koschnik, all important figures in the German politics. They did a fantastic, fantastic job there. Hans, and this is uh, part of my, part of my, uh, of my talk, has, next to being a true European, also been a very open ambassador for transatlantic collaboration. And he's proven this over, over the years in, in many ways. Here is a shot from the D2 uh, mission where Hans came with his jacket and all the patches up there. Uh, uh, Helmut Ewald will, will be jealous of, uh, of, all, of those, all of those patches, but that was Hans too. Make a long story short, Hans was the program director on the industrial side. And as you know, the Space Lab was a learning the masterpiece which led to Columbus, which led to the European participation in the International Space Station. We had uh, a uh, memoriam, a, a workshop, a history workshop uh, in 1997 you find Hans right here, as always the tallest in the, in the back row, Reimer, Reimer Lust was director general, predecessor of uh, Jean-Jacques at that time. You find number, a number of people whom you, whom you know. I am not sure whether uh, Ernesto Valerani is on there, uh, but uh, Ascaraca, I'm sure you find him somewhere, who is another major figure in the, in the MESH consortium in the development of uh, of uh, Space Lab. And the last uh, sequence of uh, photos I have come from the 25th uh, years of Space Lab anniversary in Bremen, where Jean-Pierre Coase, who I've already mentioned, who was the first program director on the ESRO side, uh, together with Doug Lord from NASA, were the happy, happy uh, uh, celebrators uh, in their hands with uh, both of them. And Hans Ortner, I should mention, I don't know whether Hans Ortner is here, who played an important role in the early negotiations of the Space Lab deal. And I end with my favorite shot of Hans, which came from that, uh, from that evening, where Hans, in his friendly, convincing, competent way, addressed uh, all of his collaborators, many of which he's had uh, very and maintained very, very close. Uh, personal friendships, one of the traits of Hans to maintain very close personal friendships. So, Hans, we miss you, and I think uh, many of you will share that, uh, and uh, I think we should all thank him for his friendship uh, and for what he did for space. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maria. Well, not difficult, uh, very difficult to speak now about uh, uh, Angs. Uh, we are beautiful things. We, we had a uh, sort of uh, uh, quick summary uh, uh, of the, about the professional dimension of Angs. Uh, let me just uh, spend and share a few minutes with you uh, about this very profound uh, human dimension. Uh, I had the privilege to meet uh, Hans many, many years ago while uh, he was already very famous, big important industry man, by the way, belonging to the competing company. Huh? I was working already with Ernesto Valerani. So in that uh, occasion, uh, I was a young uh, a female engineer and uh, in those days, it was not easy at all for young people to be given a voice, especially if the young people mm, were girls. Uh, that has never applied to Hans. Uh, we were sitting uh, together, uh, yes, at a similar table. Well, what you see here is a picture I put together uh, for his birthday uh, last year. And I think that uh, it's a summary, really, of uh, uh, the beautiful personality uh, of Hans. He was uh, enriching uh, our world meeting by carefully listening to people first. So he was a good listener. 
um, always ready uh, to give advices as a wise man. He was always available to meet people. He was, I, I should say it really, he always find time for people uh, to understand the people need and uh, if possible uh, to give advices. And uh, so we greet, we greeted him. Uh, we will miss him a lot. Uh, he was always uh, arriving at the bureau meeting, you all know that, eh? with the typical white envelopes. And in each envelope, he had pictures for all of us from the previous meeting. He was a wonderful photographer with, with his old-fashioned camera, eh? uh, but the pictures were super. And so, I don't know if I shall share it, but. Anyway, uh, during the last uh, meeting, we were meeting in Toronto, I was taking pictures eh, of people. And while I was still in Toronto, uh, I was trying to send this picture. And you know that, that the wireless connection were not working so properly. Eh? So I didn't really manage eh, to send Angs the picture. So I was there sitting beside him, and I was telling him, I'm going to forward you the picture I took about you. And they never went through. So when I went back home uh, in my office, I finally was able to, to send the picture I had taken of him counting. You know, he was our reliable, super gentleman person eh, that was always involved in checking votes and so on. And so I managed to send him the picture and the last email I had from him um, is something that I will always keep very dear for me. He said, finally somebody took some pictures of me. Uh, thank you. And thank you because uh, I really appreciate that this person is you, uh, that we're able to catch my best moment within a community that I really love a lot. So I believe I leave you guys uh, with friends, eh, with this uh, sort of uh, um, arrivederci eh, from Mans. He has been uh, doing his best to help the Federation growing. And uh, he has always uh, considered each of us a special friend as if he has been a special friend for us. And I think that we send him a kiss and a big applause, and we'll see him wherever in our next journey. And I leave uh, the stage to you, please. Thank you. Yes, farewell, Hans, the perfect gentleman. Right from the very beginning when I took up uh, the position of executive director, he was there, he was a friend, he was a mentor to me, and he always had an open ear, and he always uh, was there with advice. He, I could learn a lot of lessons, but there is also, at that occasion today, one lesson which I could even learn from Hans, and that is that we must live in such a way that people should miss us when we die, like we will all miss Hans. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming for this uh, memorial event.